Let's go. Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm here with Daniel Locke, who I'm delighted to meet for the first time. Daniel, thank you so much for being on my podcast, the Fired Up Leader podcast, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So just to let everyone know where, where we met <laughs> is LinkedIn. Um, I've been more active on LinkedIn. I was really impressed with uh, your posts, Daniel, what you were sharing about change leadership and about portfolio careers, which you're going to share a bit about. And um, yeah, just uh, was uh, so impressed, got, got chatting with you and said, would you be interested in coming on? So delighted that you're here. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Daniel, can you explain? You're an organizational change specialist, but you'll explain a little bit better than I will about the because you've got you're quite you've got quite diverse offerings, don't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, uh, I, my specialist and profession is organizational change management. So, for listeners who may not be super familiar with what that is, yep. is that's organizational change management is around um, helping the organization get ready for whatever technical solution that you know is being is being built. So, for example, uh, you know, project management is all about getting the or the technical solution ready for the organization, whereas organizational change management is about making sure that the organization is ready for that technical solution. And so, I've been doing that since um, about 2012, um, full time, and I've been in change and transformation, and project management, and uh, business analysis, and that whole sort of world since mm -hmm. 2000 and um, three, so uh, over 20 years now. And so, um, I. Uh, I'm Australian, I live in Germany now, and we moved here last year from Sydney where I was living and, and doing that work. And then since then, I've been, um, to your point, building up my LinkedIn profile, which has grown significantly in the last year. And um, and now I do coaching and, and some consulting work, not a heap of that, but in organisational change. Mm -hmm. I uh, also um, have a you know a relationship that I with a change management software platform that I support uh, as well um, and then also um, I help people build out to your point your portfolio careers so like I have a range of offers now um, built through my you know, marketing channel on on LinkedIn and I help others coaches consultants or um, people we, career professionals to develop their own offer and then use LinkedIn to market that so that's becoming a, an increasingly big piece of of my uh, my my income and work Right. Wonderful. Yeah. So for, for, for today, I do want to focus on change management and self-leadership, but before that, let yep. me um, just t talk a little bit about portfolio career, because mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. didn't know what that was. I had to Google it actually. When, um, so if you could share a little bit about that for anybody that might be interested, who's, who's listening, yeah. what exactly that is. Yeah. It, look, it's just a, uh, it's a, the way I think about it is um, uh, how career professionals can monetize their knowledge. So many career professionals, they might be uh, 40 years old, they've been in the workforce for 20 or 25 years, um, uh, they're really experienced, but they're sort of wondering, look, I'd like some more autonomy in my life. I'd like some more freedom. I have an entrepreneurial itch, but I'm not sure if I want to, how, to what degree I want to explore that. Um, some people are really committed to it. They're already doing coaching work and they really want to, to create a, a full-on business. But um, it's a way of, I think, um, creating a, a portfolio of, of income work offers. So, for example, uh, one client uh, is a director in a technology company and he wanted to create a, a uh, coaching offer that he could do alongside his career. He didn't want to leave his career. He had no intention of it. But he's yeah. very passionate about this particular, about coaching people in a similar way that he got coached when he became uh, a, technic, a tech, tech leader from being an individual contributor. And, and so um, it's a way of monetizing your knowledge um, into products and services, coaching relationships, or even consulting services. But it also extends to, uh, I work with uh, boutique consulting firms and helping them create um, other mm -hmm. offers within boutique consulting as well, rather than just BitTo consulting, helping them create training programs and cohort-based uh, coaching programs and so on and right. so forth as well. So Really interesting, um, yeah. And really building all of that off the back of a B2B professional brand that you own, um, and building that out on LinkedIn. And I think the, the opportunity here is there now on LinkedIn to build these B2B yeah. professional personal brands that you can then um, sort of direct at different offers through time. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, there's such opportunities there. And I'm like you with, a, you know, I love to, I've been, as I told you before we went live, um, my focus has been on Facebook 
and I, I always I can always see an opportunity for people to monetize and and I love helping them to to discover that and like you were talking about um uh the the training cohort uh, training which I was just looking on Maven a fantastic platform I'm going to uh, create a mm -hmm. training on there mm -hmm. and they're projecting I don't know it's got, it's going to like triple or it's exploding the 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 market for uh for trainings and you know people that are, have specializations I think they don't realize what's possible for them by you know creating those products and having that side income right absolutely and that the boutique firm actually that was maven was the platform we used to create really? that program yeah. mm -hmm. um and so maven's um really good for those remote virtual online programs and i think it's yep. you know cohort based i think it's terrific exactly. it's a great yeah. platform they take care of a lot of the back end and the landing pages and some of the email technology and so on so it's all sort of packaged up for you and yep. it's going to grow like as People Absolutely. develop out their their experts in these B two B professional mm -hmm. personal brands. They can then leverage platforms like LinkedIn, uh, uh, Maven rather, to yeah. you know mm -hmm. create those offers. Yeah, absolutely. And just for people who don't understand what cohort means, the difference a cohort training is a kind of a group. There's a lot more involvement, right? It's a, there's a higher success rate with people completing those trainings when there's a that's right. So like if you think about just a, a typical yeah, exactly an online course. The completion rates that uh, I've seen studies is like less than 2%. Yeah, 3% is what I read, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. courses they buy. Whereas a cohort course, people go through together, they're doing yeah. activities on the spot. It's related, very much directly related to their problems that they're dealing with, that they're trying to solve for. So I think it's mm -hmm. a terrific idea. And people like have got all sorts of skills that they can really leverage. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. Teach uh, I mean, I've seen yeah. yeah people reach seven figures, like teaching knitting, you know, crazy things. Yeah. Or uh, during COVID, there was one guy uh, who exploded. He had uh, how to make a garden shed. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the possibilities are just endless. I you love know, it. And he, yeah. he had a seven figure business because everybody oh, suddenly awesome. was at home and there's yeah. demand uh, rose. And it's like, yeah, I mean, people could be sitting on uh, a big idea idea that um yeah it's fantastic it. yeah yeah so let's go back to change management daniel could you explain that to somebody who who's new and the difference between change management and change leadership that's interesting for me yeah 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 so the main thing i post about on linkedin is change management and change mm -hmm. leadership and so so change management as a discipline as it's referred to is like i said it's, it's about getting the organization ready for the solution so if you, if you think about it like that you know, the project manager, they've got a, some technology solution, it could be a new process or, um, um, you know, uh, uh, some sort of risk, uh, you know, transformation, so, you know, there's some yeah. technical solution that the organisation needs for whatever reason. And um, and there's a lot of things that, you know, specialists and engineers and so on that need to build this, this solution. So, but ultimately, people are the ones who need to use this solution and adhere to it. Yes. And so... Um, we need to make sure they're ready. So they've got to be aware of it. They've got to know what, what's coming. They're not going to know why it's important, how it's going to affect them specifically. And there's, if you think about a large organisation, there's you know, all different ways that different people, at different layers of the organisation will be impacted and affected, um, and both positive and negatively. Um, if there's lots of negative ones like say reorgs and people are, are losing their jobs, we've got to address that. How do we address that? And who do we, what people right. do we get involved to start dealing with that? And how do we communicate those messages and who to and how, and how do we make sure they're trained? So all of this stuff is change management, um, the act. And so only large organizations typically need this, but smaller organizations and projects can look after it themselves. But as you start to increase the complexity across a large organization, um, it needs to be managed in a disciplined fashion. And so that's what organisational change management does. Right. Um, the leadership component, though, is change leadership. So what that's about, that is about the, the change is hard. And so someone needs to mm. push through the resistance. Someone needs the organisational resistance, the individual resistance. So it, like someone needs to lead the organisation through it. Right. Now, that's the job mm. primarily of the sponsor a project sponsor, and it's all about leadership. But leadership is required all through that organisation and that sponsor is the primary person that's uh, galvanising the leadership from other important stakeholders, from individuals, from the middle management, from the frontline management, frontline leaders, all the way down to the directly impacted people on the front line. And so leadership is the number one thing that makes yeah. organisation organisational change succeed mm -hmm. or fail. And so I speak to a lot about organisational leadership that's required um, to, right. to really drive change in an organisation. Yeah. So so what makes it succeed and what makes it fail? What's the main reasons? 
Well, it's really leadership, like a, a conviction. So the amount of conviction that um, a leader has uh, that this change is important, why are we doing it? Why are we doing it now? Their, their ability to put time into the project. So a sponsor typically will, will already be doing working 50 hours a week in their ordinary job, and then yeah. they've got to lead this project as well. One wonders whether or not there's sufficient conviction there that they this organization is in, this project is important to the organization such that they're going to make you know are they going to make space and time for the leader to to actually lead this project the sponsor right so convictions yes. are, convictions huge um, the other one is trust they need to have the trust of the organization and trust of the key key uh, uh, influences in the organization um, so if people need to trust that what they say is true particularly in those harder projects the reorgs and things like this trust is just so critical. Um, and you build trust through authenticity. You build it through mm. your your competence um, in, in in your domain, and you also build it in the you know the logic, the rationale of this project, and why you know why that's important. So you start to get those three elements. So you're building trust is really important. Um, the conviction is really important, and then your communication skills, and then um, your ability yeah. to advocate for and roll people into this new possibility. Why it's important for the organisation, how people will benefit from it directly or directly and, and why we should be doing this project now. And so they should be out there. They need to be out there leading on the front, so to speak, um, speaking at all key key programs and uh, opportunities, sending messages, town hall, and all the rest of it to, to create those messages, <clears throat> create that, right. galvanise the organisation. And there's probably a fourth thing. It's very easy for sponsors to be very busy and uh, delegate away, try to delegate away there. Uh, the responsibility of being a sponsor to a change manager, for example. But ultimately, you really want that authentic voice in that leader um, creating those messages very directly, very passionately in about why this project is important and how to drive it. So there's some of the key factors that come into leadership yeah. and change yeah, yeah. leadership. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense listening to you. It makes, I mean, you know, our company, do companies typically, are they quick to hire consultants to help in this situation? Because it sounds like it's very much needed. Just when we look at the statistics for the amount of uh, staff that, you know, staff turnover and um, burnout and, you know, staff are not happy, right? It's uh, employees, uh, you know, the, the the statistics show that I, th I think it's 18% um, are loud quitting, which is a term, you know, for they're totally not engaged. About 57% are quietly quitting and the rest are you know pretty much there but you know with statistics like that it's really important right that the I believe uh, it yeah I yeah. believe it look I mean, uh, look, leadership is a key factor throughout all of business and life as as we know um and, and, but as it pertains to change like you know you, they need to push through all of that sort of cynicism and skepticism and and that disengagement people have in their work yeah. and really galvanize people to get on board and behind a change. And it's very right. like it's challenging. It's very difficult. And to shift a big organization can be quite quite the task. Um, there's a lot of vested interests in different aspects of an organization about why they should keep it the way it, it always didn't do things the way it's always been done. Um, yeah. But to your question, which was, you know, do you bring in consultants and so on? Um, so typically, yeah, it's not unusual for so organizations will to some degree have uh, large organizations to some degree will have um, internal change teams. Okay. So change, specialist change managers, they hire yeah. on a permanent basis um, or hire people on contract basis. I did a lot of that in Sydney. Uh, so contracting in, as a change manager, working on project to project in different organizations. Uh, also consultants, of course, you know, the big four and so on. Um, and But one thing they can't hire away for is the sponsorship and leadership. You cannot do that. That must yeah. come from within the organisation for someone who has skin in the game, mm. um, and that so that that cannot be hired away. But certainly, you know, like the change management aspect, certainly you can bring contractors in and consultants to help with that, um, and advise, but uh, provide specialist advice or services throughout that pro program. Um, the role of a change manager or pra change practitioner, you know, leading change, a, a change director, or so on, is to really work with those sponsors, and they can't do the leadership for them, but they. They can say, okay, you know, when it comes to leading change, these are all the considerations. This is the end to end. This is what it looks like. This is all the stuff we need to consider right. and deal with yeah. and structure. Mm -hmm. And this is how we structure messages. And they create all of that backbone and infrastructure for the, the, leader, the leadership. They're not expected to do that. Uh, but there's only thing, certain things only the, the, the sponsor can do in, in their leadership role, which is, you know, advocating for the change, 
mm. being out there, delivering key messages at the right times. Um, and people people want to hear from like the why of the project, why why now, why are we doing this project? I mean, people want to hear from the key leaders of the organization. They don't want to hear from the change manager, contractor about that. They want to hear from the key leader. And then as it pertains, you know, uh, the key impacts and how it's going to impact their day to day and the specific right. they want to hear from their they want to hear from their frontline manager and frontline leader. And so this leadership notion of leadership gets cascaded and certain messages should come from certain people within the organization, uh, depending on where they fall into the hierarchy of, of leadership. Mm, yeah, yeah, really interesting. I'm really interested in in the science behind, you know, why people resist change. And I mean, it makes sense if they're, um, you know, any, any of us. I remember actually when I was, I had a, an osteopath and I was moving from Geneva to Nairobi. And I remember him saying, you're going to be really tired the first couple of months for no other reason than you're, you're to put your cups away and, you know, the dishes away in different cupboards. And it takes just a, a millisecond longer to think about that. It, it goes down to those nitty gritty little things, right? So inside organizations as well, it's like, oh, a new application, a new manager, a new way of doing things. It's tiring, right? And um, employees are already stressed out. So it's... Uh, Absolutely. And it goes to the point of uh, change fatigue, right? Uh, yes. People talk about. Very real. And it, for all the reasons you just cited, yeah. you know, doing things differently in a new way requires brain power and emotional and sort of emotional um, and spiritual energy to some extent to yeah, go resilience. through those changes. Exactly. Resilience mm-hmm. as, as they're moving through their own change journey. And it sort of depends on the degree of the impacts for people. Um, but, you know, something as simple as a new system and, and can be just, you know, their jobs aren't meaningfully changing, but a new system and then they've got this other change that they're dealing with and they've got, you know, their BAU issues and, and, and uh, you know, maybe their job's impacted as well. And so this all sort of adds up to being an experience, an experience, having an experience of lots of change and change of team. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which and the, that can be a tipping point for 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 some staff or employees. So, mm. how uh, what how much uh, how great a role do you think self leadership and self leadership coaching plays in a situation like? So uh, can you define? Um, uh, so in your context, can you define um, mm-hmm. self leadership? Self leadership. Well, self leadership for me would be um, developing good healthy habits, so that you know to develop that resilience, uh, developing um, good self awareness, good awareness of others and um good emotional intelligence really so does that come into or do do staff typically get training in, in those areas in change it's situations it's a great point um probably not as much as i should to be fair um but it depends on the nature of the project so it could be as simple as providing capacity physical capacity so uh, you're doing a uh, an accounting project and you general ledger system and there's a bunch of accountants that need to come off the floor to design this new system or well, we need to backfill you know those accountants for example um uh so so that's one way of looking at it um the other is uh you've got a really sort of sensitive project and people need to um work through you know a sense of self-leadership so you know self-awareness eq um, understanding resistance, where it comes from, how to think about it from a personal point of view. And yeah. that does happen, and I have trained to that end. It probably should happen a lot more, um, to be fair, in organisations to build that capacity mm-hmm. in, in a personal resilience. Um, right. It's definitely a big part of it to the extent that people take responsibility for their own resistance. and their appearance Yeah, their, I love that, that the responsibility part. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And they it's sort very of cause easy to... To blame, yeah. right? To blame the organization. But I do believe that it's the organization's responsibility to provide the tools so that employees can navigate change better, right? To help them, to support oh, them, um, to give them the tools they need for... for uh, but as a change service. manager, like, you you know, one of the, the big things you do is you start to look at, okay, who's impacted and to what degree through an impacts analysis. And from there, you start right. to form, you know, what are the right interventions and support structures that you want need to put in place? And parts of that could be training on, self-leadership as you put it um yeah. uh you know and i have done that for you know as part of the interventions i've done other it could be also just pragmatic stuff like you know you need to know the system used to do this and now it does that um yeah. you know you just need to know very pragmatic things to but, increase confidence yeah that's right and it really comes from that impact analysis where you're saying who's impacted to what degree and how and then from there you craft a range of interventions to support people 
So there's very specific processes. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm curious if uh, personality tests come into that. Do you, you know, to see, you can tell from some personality tests how people will, will react, you know, some, do you use any personality testing? No, I don't. Um, so I'm not a big believer in personality tests either, per se. Um, right. And and in an organisation, large organisation, you know, change, you know, I don't know, you'd have much capacity to, to kind of do that. It might be right. worth it as individual teams could could do it. Um, I think ultimately um, I'm a big believer in behavioural science for organisational yes. change where we, we're looking at well, what's the desired behaviour that we're trying to see, uh, we would like to see, and how do we support people in in, in exhibiting and doing those new behaviours. And so we look from rather than try and guess what's in people's heads, um, let's just look at observable behaviour that we're trying to, to create and how do we create that, how do we support that. Um, yeah, good, yeah. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if we want people to, um, um, you know, clean up after themselves, or well, it, it might be as simple as just putting more bin, making more bins available to, for people. <laughs> right, <laughs> the know, practical like things. The, yeah, we don't have to go so deep. <laughs> we don't have to go so deep into people who are resisting, you know, cleaning up after themselves. It's, it's just some some specific specific physical reality. Another yeah. good one, you know, an example is, you know, they want to, more esoteric is getting people to eat healthier, right? Um, Absolutely. Things, um, That's really the yeah. work that I do. It's it's just the simple things, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Ex some exercise. Of those, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was, I think it was the Obama administration uh, 10 or so years ago put something in place in schools. Uh, they wanted the schools, you know, how do we get students to make healthier choices? And yeah. there was a lot of just simple behavioural things that they did where they just put like, the unhealthy food at the bottom and the healthier food at the top at eye level, mm -hmm. easier to access, and people just automatically make healthier choices. Interesting, yeah, to support people. I mean, that's yeah, that's that's very. I think that um, that that should be emphasised more in organisations for because it affects our hormones, our moods, and stress levels, right? Um, Absolutely. Uh, eating, exercise, uh, getting enough sunshine, and um, yeah, just having that. that that joy factor in our lives as well. And yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah, I love it. And so, so just looking at those, I, I, so I really love behavioral science for that. Just looking at those, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the observable behavior rather than trying to guess what's in people's head, not, not that people's emotional or, or um, you know, their experience of work on a, isn't important because it is um, yeah. and, a and a specific change because it is important and you, know, and you need to speak to that. And allow people to vent and have opportunities to to process um, process change accordingly. Um, um, but but certainly, you know, we can support people in many, many, many more ways than we often think we can, just through simple behavioural interventions. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And leaders as well. I heard a stat that seventy percent of the you can determine seventy percent of su the success comes from the leader. Uh, would you agree with that? That if if a change initiative is going to be successful, that it's it lies seventy percent on the leader. Yeah, I mean, um, ProSci, the uh, the uh, founders of the ADCAR model do a study every year, and and their study repeatedly points to that being the case. Yes. Um, and I don't know the, the official number. Whether it's seventy percent, I don't know. Ninety nine percent, maybe in some instances. The right. reality yeah. is, lead, lead, leadership is everything. Yes. Um, in organisations. To your point about self leadership, but that notion of leadership of causing uh, things to happen that weren't going to happen anyway, to not just put up with the default future or just to let things go uh, the way they always go, and to create something new in the world in the organisation takes leadership. It takes someone to take a stand and to say, "No, we're going to create something new here," um, and and push through the the human. Um, laziness and resistance that we all have yeah you yeah know, it, it is we all a laziness. experience it mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. we all Absolutely. experience it self-included you know yeah me too me too yeah i was sharing recently on the, the last episode of my podcast about my i got a new gym workout and i'm used to doing my workout and i really resisted this new workout and it's like but that's where self-awareness comes in right because you can recognize it's like oh i thought i was someone who's flexible but i'm being really stubborn right now it's good to notice right and to catch ourselves yeah. I love that. Yeah. I like those ideas, those those ideas of, uh, you know, labelling emotions in yourself and others. Um, and then as a as a point of self-reflection, I'm not an expert in these things, but I, I, I love your idea of that mm. and, and definitely powerful. And they're definitely supporting people in change to process emotions and label and, and it helps them work through it for sure. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is really interesting. Yeah, I love it. So tell me about your LinkedIn, Daniel. I'm just amazed at you know how you so quickly got this huge following. Any tips for us mere mortals with <laughs> yeah. Well, number one is um post and comment regularly every day. Um yes. uh, so just you know obviously to build a following you need to post and comment. It is possible to win business off LinkedIn without posting, I I guess, uh in the in the direct messages. But ultimately, yes. posting regularly, commenting regularly, being uh, active, posting about your core themes and, and area of expertise will build up a following in and of itself um, and traffic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen overnight. It certainly grows and it compounds. And so, you know, follower growth will follow a, a pretty predictable approach. If you post five days a week and you get your messages and dialed in, it will, it will grow. Um, yeah. The other thing is then um, looking at what works on the platform and integrating those ideas and concepts into your own your way of doing it um, yes. and your own sort of content. And then from there, you need to um, you need to get in touch with people who might you know avail avail themselves of your services. So, who is your ICP, your ideal client profile? And are they mm. on on LinkedIn? And where are they? And how do you contact them? Or right. get them to contact you? And that so would be more for, for up... business generation rather than that's for... right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, exactly. I'm I'm curious about that. What are your thoughts about cold outreach? Is that something that you're a fan of? If it's nice cold it's outreach, just... yeah, yeah, I think it's all part of the it's all part of the game. Like in the end, you've got mm -hmm. warm outreach, you've got inbound from content or or ads, you've got cold outreach, warm outreach. I mean, it's all part of the game, and I'm all yeah. for it like you know some mix match of all of those are all appropriate if you've got something good to offer the world um right. what's wrong with with letting people know certainly cold yes. outreach i my feeling is if you've got if you're putting good content out there and you've got a good personal brand and you're on youtube for example and linkedin and um you might be on instagram depending on what your offerings mm -hmm. and the core platforms but let's say you're on all of the major platforms and then you do cold email for example which is historically thought of as being a poor or the poor player and there's no you know, who wants to do that but you know well who wants to likely... receive them right i mean you know they, yeah. we get a lot of spam messages in our in our linkedin that's right but inbox, if you were to get one right? from but if you were to, if you if we didn't know each other already and if yeah. you were semi-familiar with my content or if you receive an email and you're like who yeah. is this guy like this sounds interesting but you know it could be spam i look up this daniel luck guy i do a google search oh he's got a website he speaks about this he's on linkedin he's the, oh okay it just adds to the Add to the right uh, and uh, yeah and that would not aggressive. that that would not really be cold outreach though because there was and that's actually what happened right it was war because you i can't even remember what the post was about but i commented on it and then we chatted on the, because you had some you were offering a, a, a free uh training so yeah that's, that's how it right. happened which would be that would be more warm outreach right than um well that's just inbound right so you came inbound and then we had a conversation yes. um so that's inbound off content uh the point i was trying to make is <clears throat> cold outreach is is uh, totally fine, uh, but if you're doing a lot of content and you have a big presence out there on a personal brand, then you know yeah. cold email will work uh, will work even better. Yeah, it, it does make sense. Yeah, yeah. So um, you mentioned consistency, consistent posting, and it, are you a fan of habits? How's your self leadership for? Um, yeah. I think ha habits is a very important part of uh, leading That's ourselves. Right. Yeah. That's right. I think when it comes to LinkedIn, you know, um, for example, uh, you know, the gold standard is to post once a day, seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year. Um, seven days a week. Uh, wow. Weekends. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's the gold standard. Um, I post my personal commitment to myself is to put, post five days a week, Monday to Friday. Yeah. And, um, and the weekends are optional for me. Uh, the way that's the way I treat it. Um, and I think posting five days a week is what you, you know, Monday to Friday is best practice if you want to generate meaningful business out of the platform. Yes. Um, and so from a self-leadership point of view, that's my commitment to myself and how I orientate. And, and the people I coach, it takes something, and I experience the same thing, to organise yourself, to post every yes. day something of value and then quality and to get yourself like to make the space and the time and absolutely the yeah yeah where, where, which is where scheduling comes in. And if I recall correctly, I think you said you post every day at 8.30 a.m.? You share that's that right. in the, yeah, which yeah. is great, right? It's just having that commitment for, you know, having it in your that's schedule. Right. This is the time of the day I do it. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And I think it's, it, look, that's also best practice. And I think what, what works on the algorithm is to post at the regular time every day um, right. for a few reasons. One is uh, the, the algorithm. I don't know if it, if it literally gets to know you, but ultimately people yeah. in general who follow you will get to know that you post at a regular time. 
Um, and so that they can then look out for your post and potentially co- like and comment on it. And I likewise do similar, the same for others. Uh, yep. So I think this is the benefit that goes to the benefit of posting at the same time every day. Mm. Also, you know, in the morning, people are most likely to be on LinkedIn. Uh, as opposed yeah, before to they dive into their day, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm curious though because it's it's time consuming, right? When you write a good post and you get like well, you get sometimes more than a hundred comments, right? I think, or maybe yeah, two hundred. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a lot hundreds. to reply. Do you have somebody to help you, or do you reply personally to all the comments? <laughs> At the moment, I I do my absolute best to reply to everybody, and I do my absolute best to reply to comment on um, as many. Uh, people in my niche and colleagues and peers uh, yep. posts as well. Like I want to be an active member of the community and an active um, demonstration of supporting mm. supporting other people's posts who support mine as well. Uh, yes. There's a bit of reciprocity there. But, you know, that's my goal for myself. It is as my profile is growing and the comments and engagement on my posts, it gets it does get more challenging. And I could only I can only imagine what it's like for people who have hundreds of thousands of followers. It, it's not Absolutely. possible. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I am uh, later today. I actually have a call with someone to talk to them about um, supporting me in 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 LinkedIn um, infrastructure. Like, because it, it it it's a big commitment, but you do make it is well worth it because you make money out of it. Um, yeah. But it you know all the effort that goes into writing content, getting good at writing content, engaging right. uh, uh, the visual aspects of it. I mean, it just takes time and money and. But, you know, it's like any investment in marketing. It just, that's what you know, need to be front Absolutely. and Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you definitely, you're, you're reaping the rewards of that hard work. So final question then, Daniel, I know you've got a very busy day and I'm really grateful for your time here, but I'd love to know um, for your, what are your self-leadership practices to to keep you feeling energized and, you know, with, with busy days? What do you do to take care of yourself? Well, it's a really good question. It's something that I need to do more of and, um, and think more about is uh, uh, meditating. I actually did a little meditation session this morning and I find that enormously beneficial when I do it. I just don't yeah, do it too. regularly enough. Um, uh, journaling again, oh my goodness, you know, when I do it and I and I, I do, I've sort of lately I've taken the mind maps as a form of journaling. Yep. Um, I find that again, tremendously helpful um, mm-hmm. and I need to do it more of. Um, and um, uh, uh I think, you know, different times over my career, I've had coaches and worked with counselors and things like that. And I find all of that stuff tremendously yeah. valuable because nothing's Absolutely. more important than your um, having a real centered peace of mind just opens up. You can, you can access more of your cognitive resources, your spiritual, yes. emotional resources to Absolutely. deal with the world as it is. And um, all super important um, areas of, of life and self-leadership and, you know, probably need to invest more in those areas to be fair. Yeah. 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 That's where the, the habits comes in. I do. I meditate mm. first thing. Yeah. I do a lot of, uh, um, and then and, journal. And, yeah. Yeah. And from habits like, you know, exercising. So when I was in Sydney, I always exercised in the morning. There was more of a culture of that. It's very different here in Germany in that regard. Um, so I have, since I've been in, you know, Germany, I've struggled with a lot of those habits and to your mm-hmm. point about moving, you know, a lot of those habits and structures that, often revolve around social structures as well um it's yep. been challenging and um so so those that's definitely been a big shift for me is you know shifting those behaviors and habits. yeah it takes time right to to yeah and, and it, i think yeah scheduling is, is the best thing i'm really curious if you have time for a, a question just about the germany what, what what prompted you thanks daniel what prompted you to move to germany from sunny australia <laughs> yeah yeah good question um look my wife my wife is german we have two children okay uh, now i have right. uh, six and eight and yeah. um, they have german passports but we really wanted them to have the german experience really get the language yes. um so that was on our agenda plus a little bit of adventure as well for us um and the living arrangements came together. Um, my contract in Sydney was coming to an end and, you know, it was kids were of, of that age where it was the time to go at that age and not later. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we took the we took the plunge and um, it's been a terrific experience. The kids are going really well with it. Wonderful. And it's been a big, a big adventure for, for myself, that's for sure. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm curious how far you are from the Swiss border, actually. I'm thinking you're probably not, not too far. far. So, 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 so Stuttgart is... Um, Stuttgart, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were talking before the call. Uh, you lived for a while in that Constance. Yes. Um, um, so it's about two hours from there. Right, yeah. And from Geneva, I think I've driven it 
It was about five hours, I think, from Geneva. Anyway, my, my point is there's a, there's a nice network. I've, just LinkedIn's yeah. been fantastic for me. I had uh, lunch last week with a guy from Zurich and uh, oh, from yeah. uh, near near um, uh, near Lausanne. And uh, yeah, it's just nice for networking. So um, if we have one over the Zurich side, I'll let you know. And uh, it'll be lovely to, to meet you. That's, yeah. that's the, the, the positive effects of social media. So really grateful to connect with you, Daniel. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise. Sure. And Thanks where can people me. where can people uh, reach you, Daniel, if they uh, want to chat with okay. you about yep. working together? Yep. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very, very active on LinkedIn. So um, yeah. Uh, my my handle is just you know the LinkedIn prefix uh, with Daniel Locke at the end, so you'll find me there. I have a website. Yep, mm -hmm. that's right. L O C K. I have a website, uh, DanielLock.com. Again, Daniel uh, L O C K one word dot com. So my website yep. also. Um, so they're probably the best two places to find me okay. soon. YouTube uh, coming. I do have something on YouTube currently, one video, and okay. um, it's something I want to. Uh, invest Spend. in more heavily very soon mm -hmm. yeah for sure I, be I bet you'll go really fast I mean <laughs> I've had a YouTube channel for years but again yeah it's the investment with the the time and learning uh, the outreach so yeah I'm sure you'll master that fast too well thank you Sounds so much good. Daniel and thanks everybody for tuning in likewise Here.